Hello, welcome to MCFC 9320 Group. And this evening, we are absolutely proud to have the funniest man on the planet behind me, <laughs> Mr. Les Chapman on. Hello, Chappie, how are you? Uh, good evening, I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. I wouldn't agree you. with your opening statement, but I'm okay, thanks. What do you no, think? He got it, he you got it wrong, funnier, is me. You think you're funnier than me, Chappie? <laughs> no. Uh, Seriously, thank you. When I'm on form, yes, I would have to say so. At my peak. Yeah, well, we've we've all seen your famous videos and stuff like that. and Well, you haven't seen half the videos. We're, because well, half the videos were done internally uh, and not for publication. <laughs> Funnily enough, uh, we've got uh, a few of these, right? I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, um, yeah, I want to kick off, chappy, with... Uh, People know Les Chapman as the, you know, the funny kit man at, at City and stuff like that. What, what they probably don't realise, you made, is it 747 or 749 league appearances? Just league appearances, yes. And uh, I suppose if you had the cup games, not that I'd got through to many, <laughs> didn't get through to any quarterfinals, so it probably is about between eight and 900 total appearances. But then... I also had four months spell in America where I played about 30 odd appearances. And of course, if you take into account pre-season friendlies, uh, post-season games, uh, it's, I would imagine it's around about a thousand. Yeah. Your little, your little spell in America. Yeah. You didn't win many over there because of the, the way they, uh, th they did the games at the time. Like there was no draws. They had to go to a no draws. Shootout. Yeah. You had, um, you had a, a shootout, it, there was a line 35 yards from the goal line and you stood on that line with the ball and the referee blew his whistle and you had five seconds to score. <laughs> and each, each team took five each and obviously the, the winner of the shootout won the game. Yeah, there were no draws. Uh, <clears throat> we brought the NASL record, 13 straight losses. Uh, we were a shocking team. Uh but it was a fantastic experience. Travelled all over America. Uh, and uh, I tried to get back there, actually, but I was contracted to Oldham at the particular time. Uh, and in those days, you, you couldn't just... You weren't free to travel anywhere. You couldn't, like, sign for another club because even if your contract ran out, they held your registration. So uh, I couldn't, unfortunately, go back there, but... Uh, I did have a, a fantastic four months. And in, in fact, I can remember the 13th loss to break the record. We played at uh, Detroit against Detroit Express in the Silver Dome, which was an indoor stadium and AstroTurf pitch. And we all sat in the dressing room waiting for the manager to come in, a guy called Terry Fisher, to tell us the starting lineup. So we're all sat there and he walked in with this young lad, 18 year old lad called Carl Christensen. And he introduced him. He said, this is Carl Christensen. He's 18 years old and he's the top collegiate, ath collegiate athlete in the whole of the United States. And he's starting tonight and he's got the job of marking Trevor Francis, who was on loan for Detroit Express from Birmingham at the time. But he was a brilliant player then, even at 18, 19, quick, quick as lightning. Uh, anyway, Trevor Francis scored five in the first 20 minutes and we lost 10 nil. <laughs> he never played again. Uh, but that was that was to break the NASL record of 13 straight losses. Did you have a celebration at the end when you knew you'd broke the record? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could sing. I want to thought so, I don't know. No, <laughs> no. He's, he, and as I say, you know, 747, you know, league appearances alone. That, that's, I think you're still up there. Is it something like 15th? Uh, 15th, I think, yeah. In, you know, I think the top three positions are occupied by goalkeepers. So, so it's, it's, it's some feat that, isn't it? I don't mean you've yeah. got seven. I, seven I was feet. also a member of the 92 club, which meant that I'd played on every ground right. in the country at one particular time. I obviously haven't now because there's so many new teams come into the league. But at that time, I, I played on every ground. 
And you know, you know, some of it. I I say this to you know to people who ask me, you know, sit, you know, what's the best season I've seen City play? And they all automatically, they almost, they always think I'm going to go back to, you know, the season QPR when we won the Premier League for the first time. But I always say when we dip to the old third division, some some of the places we went to, like the Lincolns, the uh, the Gillingham, Yorks. Like, yeah, the Yorks, and didn't miss didn't miss a match, you know, home and away for the for the full season. And I think that I think that just integrates you, you know, more and more into the club. And as I say, some of the, some of the grounds we went to, you know, and some of the bands, you know, where we was, where we we're, we're more or less sold out the whole the home end when when we was away. Oh um, yeah. People find that bizarre when he when he you know I cite that season, but so I can relate to the 1992 club. Well, how about you, John? John, you must be up there pretty much the same. Yeah, definitely. Um... Been to some weird and wonderful places. Um, obviously, the things we've seen over the years and the, play, the the actual level of it has been off the scale to what we are now. And you can, just can't describe the football then to the football now because it's a totally different world. Hmm. Even when we, we did, you know, when we were in the old third division, when we was at Main Road and, you know, the... The worse we got, see, I didn't, sw- I didn't swear. Then the worse we got, <laughs> we just came out in force even more, didn't we? Like, for instance, like the old Gene Kelly stand and stuff like that. And I think that just typifies a, a typical city fan because these days, let's face it, you know, I'm not scared of saying it. There's, there's quite a few of the younger generation, chappy, what's a little bit spoiled, a bit spoiled, and we, we draw a match and instantly they're they're on the players' backs and stuff like that. Yeah. God, they'd never have made it in, you know, back back in the day. Question well, like, for you. Yeah. When you when we used to be at the old grounds, how much yeah. of the actual football did you watch? Uh, it varied, I suppose, from game to game. Uh, it depends who was manager at the time and how many seats there were on the bench at that particular time. There weren't half as many staff as they have now on the bench. So there was always a place for me on the bench. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> how many actual games did you actually get to watch? Oh, yeah, all in of the, them. In the old, in the, all of them. Actually, all of them. I mean, I mean, I may be five minutes late coming out for the start of the game, or I might nip yeah. in just before half time, and five minutes late coming back for the second half. But... Yeah, I've been watching the games the majority of the time. I mean, in those those early days, when you think like um, Brian Oak, Man- Joe, Joe Royal manager and people like that. I mean, we had a fantastic staff. We all got on great. It was just a, a brilliant team spirit within the staff itself. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it was the games were just as interesting and, and important to me as any other member of staff, really. So... As I said, apart from those few minutes I might have been still in the dressing room sorting stuff out, I'd watch every game. Do you mean, do you mean sorting pranks out for players? Uh, well, that would all depend on the result, of course. I didn't do many pranks when we didn't win. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, some, like you said before, some of the grounds that we went to... I can remember going to Lincoln City uh, and I went early with the kit... And the skip, the kit skip, wouldn't go into the dressing room because the the, the the entrance was too narrow. So Alex Stepney, who was goalkeeper coach at the time, came with me and he just ripped the door off its hinges and just stood it up in the corridor so we could get the kit skips in. So he saved the day. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. That's empty, everything oh. out outside. <laughs> no, it, it just shows you. So one thing that always shines through, Chappie, you know, from all the time that you've with cities, the respect that you know you've got of all you know former players and stuff like that, uh, and I know you still keep in contact with a lot of them. Uh, did they see you as uh, just a joker or a father figure as well? Because you, you you do always seem close to the player. <clears throat> yeah, uh, being in, I mean, my, my, my official title was kit man, but having been a professional footballer, being in the game since I was seventeen, eighteen. I had a lot of experience in the game. And as a kit man, you prov- you're providing a service for them. You're providing them with kit, cleaning the boots, making sure the boots are there, making 
everything pos everything conceivably possible I would do for them. I've been on holiday with them. I'd do errands for them. I'd give, offer advice. Uh, everything you could possibly think of, I would endeavour to do for them. Far away and above my official duties as kit man. Yeah. Yeah. And if you and and the fact was, I wasn't picking. I wasn't dropping them from the team. You know, I was. I was like the servant for them, really. Anything that they wanted, I would do. And because they, they trusted me in that capacity, you, for, you, you form a lot of relationships with the, the players in that dressing room. And I mean, there's nothing like being in a, a football dressing room. The, I miss it every day still. I mean, there's nothing better than being a player in a football club. Yeah. But then the second best things like a kit man were... All I do is, is every day, all I did was to help them. Like I said before, I would never, like, I wouldn't drop them from the team. It wasn't my responsibility. I would just look after them. And I think because of that, that's when you earn the respect and the, and the friendship of, I mean, it's sad in a lot of ways because you get to be really close to someone. Then they just, they, they get transferred or they leave or they go somewhere yeah. else and, you, you say know, you, you say you you you've always went above and beyond. I bet you've never been a father Christmas for any players, kids, or anything, have you? Well, you've obviously asked me that because you know I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I once I once dressed up, dressed up as Santa Claus and drove from Delft to Hill Barnes, and I was Father Christmas for Antoine Sibierski's kids. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I was crying when I read that before, and I really was. I just thought that's that's typical chappy, chappy that, and that's why you know. <laughs> You had, you had, and probably still have a great relationship, you know, with with some of the ex players. Who, who do you reckon? Who, well, in your opinion, who do you reckon was the the the, the best prankster there? Surely Harlock's got to be up there. Prankster, yeah, yeah, Harlock would be up there. Uh, ben Thatcher, right? Ben Thatcher was probably the biggest. Uh, unfortunately, he's got a very very bad reputation because of his his tattle, really on Mendes and I interviewed him about four or five, about four years ago. And he said, if he could change 30 seconds of his life, that would be it. Mm. Uh, because I said to him, when he came in the dressing room after that tattle, I said, what about your tattle on Mendes? He said, it won't get him mid top 10. <laughs> so that reputation that he had from that game has really lived with him. And you couldn't wish to meet a nicer lad. He was brilliant in the dressing room. Some of the stunts that he did, I can't even tell you about, especially towards me, things he did, you know, stitching me up with things, and I, I can't tell you. But I suppose, he I suppose, was in, the, I suppose he was in a one. way... Go on, Sorry. Chappie. I suppose he was in a way... One, really. He, 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 <laughs> he, he, he used to get the players to chip in like 20 quid or something. And he would he would concoct this glass full of tea leaves, seafood sauce, uh, anything you could possibly think of. And I'd have to drink it. But it, 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 it would raise like, it could raise four or 500 quid for me doing it, you know? So I, I thought, well, for that kind of money, I'll drink anything. And he was the one who instigated it all. Like a bush uh, took a trial. Oh, worse, worse. I mean, worse. Than, I, I once snorted <laughs> two lines of pepper about a foot in length. Not your ordinary pepper, but this coarse pepper. I snorted two lines of that, one up each nostril, and then ate a tablespoonful of pepper. And I couldn't sneeze or have a drink for five minutes. <laughs> my, my forehead went numb, and I think I lost the use of my left leg for about 20 seconds. <laughs> It was hideous. But the worst one I did was three quarters of a bottle of Tabasco. Oh. oh. <laughs> I was in bits with that one. But I got 1,200 quid for it. It's, see, and that... So how, how, did, how did it come about, you being the, the kit man? For, I don't like calling it just the kit man, because it's, it's more that it's just... It, it's a label, like, it, it, like you said yeah. before. It's, it's, it's more than just... You know, it's better than the... 
the, the title work <laughs> given you like a confidant and like say you've been there yeah. how, how did it all come about you joining City to I think, that role? well I think because of my personality my experience in football that I had before that it, I always classed it more than just a kit man but the 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 reason I became kit man was because I came to City in 92 as reserve team coach and I, I was uh, fired when Alan Ball came after a season with Alan Ball. He got rid of me because he wanted to bring Kevin Bond in. He won a World Cup, apparently, Alan Ball. He did indeed. Uh, but uh, I think it was his wife, actually, who got rid of me because she was watching us training once at Platte Lane and I was fighting with Jim Bentley on the pitch. Do you remember Jim Bentley? I do, I do yeah. Yeah, well, we were messing about and fine. She said to Alan, what, what, that's your coach. What is he doing? You know, so anyway, I think that was his excuse. So I went to Huddersfield as youth team coach with Brian Horton for 10 months. And then they sat Brian Horton and all his staff. So I had no job again. And Ronnie Evans, who was a physio at City, was helping to do the kit and he was like fed up of doing the kit and his own physio job. So he kept going on to Joe Royal, who was the manager at the time. Get Chappie in as kit, man. He's just, he's not got a job at the minute. And I didn't have a job and I had wife, two kids, mortgage to pay. So I took it. The, the Joe invited me down so for, to be, a, I think I was the first official kit man City have ever had. So yeah, I took the job. Was, was, was Big Joe the best manager you worked for? Uh, I do like Joe. He was brilliant. Great man to work for. Still very, very friendly with him. Speak to him regularly. Uh, but we've had some great managers as well. Uh, Sven was... A, Peter Reid, who signed me in 92, was great. Uh, Brian Orton was great. Sven. I mean... Was a, was, I mean, it was, it was, Sven wasn't the greatest manager as such. He was just the most charming fellow you'll ever wish to meet. The players loved him. They wanted to play for him. In fact, he's the only, he's the only manager I've seen who's got the sack where a player... We played at Middlesbrough the last game of the season. We all knew he was getting sacked. And I think we lost 8-1 or something. That's right. Yeah. And Richard Dunn got sent off. And Richard Dunn in the dressing room, because we all knew he was getting sacked. Richard Dunn in the dressing room stood up in front of all the players and all the staff and said, it had been an absolute pleasure to have worked with you for the last two years. Uh, we're devastated that you're leaving, but we wish you all the best for your future. I've never seen a player ever say that about a manager who's been sacked ever in the past before in all my career. And that, that summed him up, really. He was just an absolute gentleman. Uh, as I said, the players loved him. I mean, he, he couldn't coach or he, he, he couldn't do an inspirational team talk. His team talk could be, right, lads, pass the ball, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. But it didn't seem to matter, you know. Well, he, just... he, 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 he see, not many people, ex-pros and that's well, I, I certainly never heard a, a bad word against Fenn. And I thought it was up, really up against it because we had Dodgy Frank, uh, you know, our, our owner at the time. And it was pretty much known that Sven was going halfway through the season. So we was never going to... Um... I think we were top at Christmas. Yeah. In you know, that it, season. Because he, he signed some decent... Well... Decent players then, like the likes of the Karadis and stuff like that, you know, who, who knew where the, the back of the net was. But I don't think you're never going to be successful when it when the rumours are going about halfway through the season that that you won't be there, for, you know, because he's, he's going to be replaced with uh, sort of like the, the chairman's choice. So it, well, it was... Ch Chino Atta was a he was clueless. Absolutely clueless. Yep. The only good thing he ever did was like... Sell the club. <laughs> To the, to the people from Abu Dhabi, yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Apart from that, it was a complete disgrace. Yeah, so uh, you, you you went across to Abu Dhabi, didn't you? You know, when the when the, the new owners came in, what was, it, what was it like over there? I can remember we went to a, 
we went to a party at the chairman's hotel, Sheikh Mansour, big hotel on the beach. And we met him and all his entourage, all in the regalia and everything. Looked dead smart and they were really polite and we had to bow and shake hands with them. And then they all drifted away. And I thought, well, that was quite strange. They've come to meet us and they've shook our hand and been really polite and nice and everything. Um, but they didn't stay for the actual meal, I think. And then they just left. And I understood why after about five minutes later, they had this firework display on the beach. It was like the, du the Dunkirk landings. <laughs> I've never seen fireworks like it. It was ridiculous. And there was rockets dropping down, you know, the stems and sticks of rockets just dropping down on top of us from the sky. And <laughs> most unbelievable. Uh, but what a place. Fantastic place. We stayed in the fantastic hotel. When I, when I think back to, to that time and when I first took the job on in 97, they're, they're just worlds apart. But it wasn't, it wasn't a change that happened overnight. I think they did it in a really good way. You know, the people from Abu Dhabi, they, they changed it gradually. They built up the infrastructure gradually introduce world-class players, not all at once and that. And so, I mean, and now that for me, the, the, well, the, the best team in, in, in probably in the world, I think. Yeah, definitely. Definitely I've got the a, best I've team got in a, Europe. I've got a right. question for you, Les. Um, during your time as kit man, what's your most frightening and panicky time that you've done just before a game? I remember you telling me a story about something and I yeah. think it was to do with the kit. West Ham. West Ham away. I used to pack the kit on a Friday for a Saturday year, and we were at Carrington at the time, and I packed all the skips, five skips and about 12 bags. And the, the actual match kit, the player's kit, I wrapped in a towel with the name on the towels. That was in a separate skip. By some strange coincidence, somebody had moved that particular skip after I'd gone home on the Friday night and we travelled down to West Ham and I went to the dressing room at nine o'clock or could have been before of the morning of the game on Saturday morning, putting all the kit out, couldn't find the skip with the kit in. It was still at Carrington in the kit room. What... You, you, you can't imagine a more sinking feeling. I think the blood just drained from my head. Just, I was like, in fact, I think the, the kit man at Millwall forgot their kit in a game a couple of seasons ago. And uh, I can imagine, is he still alive? <laughs> uh, anyway, it was one of the physios, Carlo, I think, one of the sports therapists, he said, what about your spurs? So I thought, oh, yeah, all my spur kit. So I had all spur shirts, spur shorts. So I think the 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 West Ham kit lad printed a couple of pairs of shorts up for me. I had blank ones, and they put the numbers on the shorts. And then I just and Nigel De Jong played in a shirt that was about three sizes too small for him. And we borrowed. West Ham socks, but that was the worst ever feeling that I'll probably ever have <laughs> in any capacity forever. You it know, was the we, most we, asked you, we asked you to do one thing, Les, one thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was during the time that I was Mark Hughes' manager and I, I did it on my own for about eight years. And I mean, now they've got like four kit men, so... I'd regularly do like 100 hours in a week. It was, wasn't was like unusual to do that kind of stuff. It was just... It wasn't just a job to you, was it? It was your actual life. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. And, what, and people think it's glamorous, like you're with these ex fantastic players and you go to exotic places like pre-season tour, South, South Africa and um, Hong Kong and America and that. But it, it, you're not sightseeing. The, the training twice a day... 
and then you've got to sort all the kit out. You're going round to players' rooms at like midnight, collecting the kit, getting it laundered. You know, it's just it, it pre-season especially is really full on. So it's not as, as glamorous and easy as possibly some people might think. But I miss it every day. I wish I was still doing it. Yeah. Yeah. What's the what's the weirdest request you've had from a player, and who who is it for kits? That is. Uh, Gail Cliche used to wear one glove. He used to wear two gloves when it was cold, but he'd wear one glove for the handshake before the game. I might have known about COVID. <laughs> you well, never, know. It's, it's, never know. It's way back. It's, it's about five or six years, at least five or six years ago, that. Uh, Magic. All players have their own idiosyncrasies and superstitions and things. Uh, tiny ones, like, I don't know, collar off. I'd have to bring him a coffee every time he came to the dressing room for a home game. I'd have to bring him a coffee at a certain <laughs> time. And the, the fussiest for me was Peter Schmeichel. It was, like, great during the week. Came to a match day. He was a monster. He used to come in the dressing room, give me his match gloves, and I had to hide them where nobody else could see them or find them ever. And then I'd have to produce them at the right time, which was like 40 seconds before he went out for the game. And he would only shake hands in a certain order with certain members of staff. And then he'd have to have a new kit for the warm-up, a new kit for the first half, and a new kit for the second half. And he wore a nine and a half boot on one foot and a ten and a half on the other. <laughs> uh, and he's the first player, really, who was swapping shirts and keep it. He had like 92 shirts that season, which was unheard of until mm -hmm. then. So, I mean, obviously, since then, the players all take the shirts or swap them or some swap them at half time. Yeah. I've seen that. That doesn't go down well. I, nah. that, I forget what match it was now. And there was a there was a team getting beat at half time, and the players are swapping shirts at half time. I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know if it's a, a Champions League match. John John will know because he knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, it happens quite a few games. That not just that one. Yeah. It, it, so. It's yeah. It doesn't go down well. Not at half time. No, but other other players. I mean, M Roberto Mancini was the most superstitious man I've ever known in my life. Uh, he did bizarre things, and well, he had to have his own dressing room at the training ground and his own shower, and I had to take a hair dryer with me everywhere we went. What Fergie? Uh, you used to have to take Fergie around with you. <laughs> yeah, and but in the dressing room at, at Carrington. He wouldn't have a plug-in hairdryer. It had to be wired into the mains. It was bizarre. Yeah. What, what, was, what, what was it I, like? What was it like, Mancini? Because I've, I've just seen um, uh, over the. Now this is where I break the rule about swearing. <laughs> go on, Chappie, you're fine. Go on, go on. We'll let we'll let you. No. I know. I know your thoughts. No, I mean, I, I mean, people ask me about Mancini and. I always say, well, we won the league and we won the cup while he was manager. Uh, so if, if you know, you think whatever you want to think about him, um, I usually tell them one story about him when people ask me. Uh, we played Dynamo Kiev in the champ in the Europa League, so we played on a Thursday night. We fly out to Manchester on a Wednesday. Jerome Boateng, who'd only been at the club a couple of months, flew to Berlin because his wife was expecting. Twins, I think. So we land then in Kiev and Jerome Boateng lands in Berlin. And Mancini had this slave, really, is the only word you can describe him as. He was a slave called Jose Duque, who did all his nasty errands and all his dirty work and everything and all that and dealt with all different kinds of people so Mancini's telling this Jose text Boateng see what he's doing now so he's sent a message to Boateng Boateng's replied I'm in the hospital she's gone into labour um, she's having twins and so he gets a, a, re a reply message saying can you find a gym in the hospital where you can do a bit for half an hour so he obviously ignores that. Two hours later, 
he gets another message, Jerome, from this Jose, from Mancini. What's happening now? He says she's just had twins by cesarean section. She's had a really rough time. Jose messages back, message from Mancini. You've got 30 minutes to get to Berlin Airport to fly to Kiev. And he made him fly to Kiev and never used him in the game. Oh. Now we know oh. why Boateng left. Yeah, you know, the, the, you just you just sense that even coming towards the end of uh, Manchi, Mancini's reign, really, that there was a lot of uh, un, people being unsettled, you know, behind the scenes, inc you know, including players and stuff like that. That's that's why I was asking the question. Uh, did, did you see 